everyone a good day. Thank, Thank you. you very much. by Bogdan Bokshev from uh, architect from Edwiz and uh, Mr. Alexander Leru, founder CEO at Edwiz. He talks about solution uh, about uh, the rise of digital audio dueling between big data and fast data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this thing working already? That's me? Uh, no. Is, is this thing working already? Yeah, can you hear me? Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. My name is Phil, this is Bogdan, and I'm sitting right in front of the, all right, let me move. Okay, Hi, cool. Hi. So, is that our presentation? Yeah, fantastic. So, um, I understand you guys are interested in big data in general, uh, but before we talk big data, uh, let's first talk about rock and roll and music, okay? Because after all, big data and all the geeky stuff that we do is just there because we want to solve a business problem, okay? And that's the stuff we're doing. Um, next slide. Who's controlling the next slide? Who's, who's, got, who's got a zipper for the slides? Ah, you stole it. <laughs> have it okay yeah if you could just arrow down that'd be lovely you have the uh, controller fantastic okay so let's talk about rock and roll so this is the business problem we're trying to solve and big data is just like a tiny bit that helps us solve a big huge business problem that is worth something like hundred and fifty billion dollars so let me, talk you, let me tell you more about music. You see the little monkey there? This is like pretty much how my mom used to buy records like 50 years ago. She still today has this huge collection of vinyls, you know, discs. She's very proud of them, the Beatles and things like that. It's not really convenient. It's huge, it's massive, it's taking a lot of space. It's actually crappy technology, okay? But it gives a lot of emotions, okay? This is the whole thing. This industry today, the record industry, is something like $100,000 billion every year. The things are involved. People today don't buy records anymore. I suppose you don't buy records anymore, okay? Me in the 80s and the 90s, I was very proud of my collection of cassettes, of tapes, okay? Then I evolved, bought CDs, I'll spent a lot of money on CDs. That was crazy, okay? Started using Napster. Today, I'm buying things on iTunes. And actually, the way I'm consuming music it's today totally different. I don't buy anything. I don't want to own anything anymore. Okay, I've got everything in the cloud. I can listen to anything I want, whenever I want. I have my own music, and I'm also listening to radio stations. I can hear, listen, anything I want, all the stations on the planet. The big thing about FM is that you can only listen to Kiss FM if you're in Bucharest or uh, WNYC if you're in New York. When you're using internet radio, you can listen to pretty much any single station that you want. And more than ever, music is, is part of our lives. I don't know if you guys are listening to online music. Who amongst you has ever listened to music on the internet or bought something on iTunes or is a Spotify user or a Deezer user? Just raise your hands if you've listened to music. This is pretty much everybody but two people. <laughs> all right? This today is the way what, that we consume music. All right? And that brings a huge business problem because, let me skip that one. Because a couple of years ago, because people were buying CDs, they were spending money on CDs for record labels, their business was pretty simple. The more CDs they were selling, the more money they were making. For radios, radio stations, the way they make money is that they don't pay for music that they air on, on, on FM or AM or whatever. What they do is that they sell advertising on their stations. That's the way they make money. They don't need to pay for the content they're using because record labels consider that radio stations are actually amazing marketing channels. This is the way for you to get to know new artists, new you know, music genres and things like that.
But all that, that old industry, which is worth today $150 billion, so 100 $100 billion of CD sales and $50 billion of radio advertising, all that is completely changing. And all those people that are in this business see their business completely change. Some of those companies are actually on the verge of disappearing. And we, we, when I say we, we're as we, we're a company that pretty much wants to power that revolution. We want to help build those new business models that enable people to listen to the music they want. They don't need to pay 15 euros for a full CD. They can listen to anything they want, wherever they want, any sort of device, okay? But that whole thing is completely changing the business. And, sorry, I'm not sure this thing is working. So, our company is called AdsWiz. And yeah, the first thing I wanted to clarify is that we're not actually, we're not actually an airline company, okay? We're a technology company. We are um, pretty much, it's a European story that started uh, somewhere in Belgium. But today, we're pretty much like 100, 120 people. Uh, we've got 30 people in the Silicon Valley in San Mateo. And we've got here in Bucharest, most of our research and development, 60 people. Uh, the reason is a very long story. Um, the co-founder and myself, we started business here uh, a couple of years ago. We fell completely in love with the ecosystem, the quality of the engineers. We started building great teams here. And we just couldn't possibly think of building a great company not from Bucharest. So, sorry. Where should I point this thing to? Does anybody know? Right. So what we do is what? We basically do, maybe you're familiar with a product called Google Analytics, okay? That pretty much helps you understand the traffic of websites and things like that. Well, we do pretty much the same before online radios, music platforms, uh, you know, uh, digital stations, even FM stations that simulcast online, things like that. Next to that, we also have a platform called an app server, which is a piece of software that enables publisher, people that own content, to manage advertising. But this thing is much more, let's say, sophisticated than traditional advertising. Today, when you listen to a radio station, you pretty much are exposed to a lot of crappy ads, probably a lot of ads that are not relevant for you. Okay? What we do is we've built a piece of technology that enables advertisers to really target people they're interested in so that you get exposed to ads that are a bit less crappy, a bit more interesting to you. Okay? In addition to that, we've also built the equivalent of a stock exchange. I'll come back to that later on, okay? But basically, this thing is what? All the advertisers on this planet are connected through a system and they can buy media inventory or they can find audience on almost all the stations and the music platform on this planet. And this is pretty much the system that we've built. As you can understand, this system collects a lot of data. And this is where big data comes into play. So before we start talking about technology, I just wanted to give you some sort of background on the, uh, on the business side. Now, let me give you, like, well, this is a couple of stuff. And by the way, I see there is, like, a mistake. When our system runs, like, in full blow mode, it's not 100 Amazon nodes that we're using. It's 1,000 it's a Amazon nodes. So right now, it's pretty much a live system that whenever there is somebody that listens to an online station or to uh, Spotify or to uh, uh, Kiss FM your work, there is a small message that comes to our system. We analyze who you are, and we're trying to expose you to the most relevant ads, OK? We do that on about 10,000 stations and music platform worldwide, OK? So if you look at, like, pretty much two stations out of three on this planet are connected to that system. So yeah, these are some of our customers. So Hired Media, which is, like, uh, let's say the largest uh, radio company in the US, it's 850 stations. You probably know iTunes from Apple, uh, Deezer, SoundCloud. Does anybody listen to SoundCloud? Remix, mashups, and things like that? Well, it's really, really, really cool service. Um, well, these are the kind of things that, I mean, the kind of people we, we work with. And all those guys are completely revolutionizing the way that music is sold, music is consumed. That is very, very exciting. Now, big data. Okay, now that you have some background, let's talk about big data. Let me give you a concrete use case of why is it that we care about big data. So imagine that in three years' time, you'll be driving your car. And at that time, most probably your car 
we'll have a media and entertainment system that is connected via 4G or whatever to the internet at all times. You'll have Wi-Fi inside your car and everything. Your radio will pretty much be an internet radio, okay? You'll have a connection to your Spotify account, to your SoundCloud account, whatever. The thing is, you'll be connected. Now, when you'll be driving, not far from here, whatever, on Chosea Kishelev, or, you'll be exposed to an ad break at some point in time. And what we'll do is we'll be sending some data about you to a lot of possible buyers, people that are interested in engaging you and sending you a message, like L'Oreal or whatever, um, Apple or whoever, okay? And what we'll do is that we'll send messages to all those blokes and tell them, listen, there is somebody driving there at Kish not far from Kishilev. This is roughly, you know, the profile of that person. Who is interested in exposing that person to an ad? And all those people will check in their systems if they have like some sort of campaigns they want to expose you to, okay? And they will bid. They will try to buy airtime, okay? They will try to buy a couple of seconds of your time. We'll get all those bids from all those people, select the winner, and expose you to that ad that is completely relevant to your case. As you can understand, that means collecting a shitload of data. When I say shitload of data, it's petabytes of data every single hour. Yeah, our data is huge. So, of course, because we collect a lot of data, we're interested in user patterns and user profiles and things like that. But not only that, okay? What we also do is, as I was explaining, is to do real-time user profiling, okay? So we're using all that data to really try to understand who you are, okay, so that we can optimize the messages you're exposed to. Yeah, great. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mentioned advertising pretty much, and this is what Google has invented. It's pretty much become a different business than before. In the past, people used to buy, let's say, um, if you want to advertise on TV, for instance, this is still what happens, people buy like some figures. They buy a belief that if you advertise at 7 o'clock in the afternoon on TV Day 1, there'll be 10,000 people watching the stuff. Okay? It's pretty much theoretical. What Google has brought to the industry is something different. It said, listen, we have live data there. Okay, we can use all that live data. We know exactly how many people there are there. And also, we know information about people. So we can really provide more information, more data to advertisers, so that they can, on the fly, decide whether or not they want to advertise and to whom they want to advertise. Okay? So pretty much, the whole media industry is now resembling more and more like the stock exchange. Okay? You have, on the one hand, music platforms, radio stations that represent supply, and you have advertisers and media agencies that represent demand. And all of that is connected through a market, okay, which works in pretty much real time. Right, so Bogdan will, um, let's say, delve into how exactly we're using big data to borrow all these things, right? Is that the sure. slide you wanted to start with? Yeah, that's, the, that's my cue. So, you know that joke about big data and thin sex, right? Everybody talks about it, it's cool, everybody knows they should be doing it, but nobody knows if they're doing it right. And one of the wrong things about big data is that it's just one word, but it expresses so many things. And I wanted to delve into the types, first of all, of data stores that they are available. First of all, you have the um, data stores everybody's been accustomed to. The, the ones that are uh, consistent and highly available. Big data actually means exploring the other two types of data stores. The ones that are not always strictly consistent. I mean, the ones that always give the same answer to the same question to the millisecond. And the ones which are um, not always uh, partitionable. Uh, the ones which are, sorry, the ones which are not always available. Um, this is the first distinction that needs to be made if you want to uh, delve into big data because what happens is that people s think big data is one solution but it's not just one solution and for our case we had very practical problems 
as Phil said, we have a lot of data. That's the big part, right? We have roughly one terabyte of new data per day that we need to process and store the results of processing of and so on. And MySQL and Oracle DB and post conventional PostgreSQL just won't cut it, no matter how big the machines we use are. But the next question, when you want to start a big data project or you, when you want to use big data into one of your projects, is to ask, okay, it's big, it's a lot of data, but how do I need to access it? Do I need to access it fast? Is it big and fast data? Do I need to make very complex queries on it? Or do I need to make structured queries in a predictable way? And depending on the answers to these questions, or at least to this question and to a few others, you choose the kind of solution you go for. And I'm going to go into some of the, <laughs> on the types of solutions we have in our architecture. At the core of our architecture, this is the real time thing. And by real time, I mean we have 500 milliseconds to decide which ads I'm going to give to a thousand users. That's real close to real time. For those systems, we need millisecond response. We have data stores which have one to four milliseconds response time. That's the fast part. Of course, on those data stores, you cannot exactly run very complex reporting queries. The other layer is the layer that um, tunes and controls our delivery systems um, short term. Think w with an hour to hour horizon. Okay, bad spot. Um, that, those systems have response times around the minutes. And the last loop, the one in red, is the reporting, forecasting and planning queue, which doesn't need to provide results or refresh data I don't know, in five minutes. It's okay if it refreshes it every couple of hours or a couple of times a day. Um, but this kind of systems run, run very complex queries. And now I'm going to go pragmatically into some use cases that we have. First of all, we have this uh, big fast data uh, use case or situation where when we receive a request for an ad, we need to decide, we need to look up what that user has seen, uh, what that user has been exposed to, what exclusion principles apply, and we need to make that decision in 500 milliseconds, but for maybe hundreds of ads. That's why the response times that we require from our data stores are to the milliseconds. What happens is that if you use a big data solution that guarantees you persistence, that basically writes on disk or on SSD or whatever, there's no way you're going to drop, you're going to consistently drop below 10 milliseconds. You cannot consistently do that. So what we employed was uh, the so-called cache aside pattern. It means that you have a data store which on average, on average, gives you one, two milliseconds response time. But every once in a while, when the data I it accesses gets older and is no longer in this front layer, it goes to the persistent data store and it gets it from there. But this happens in only, I don't know, 10, maybe 15% of the cases at worst, which gives you an average response times which is satisfactory towards the business need. And the actual business need in this case is I cannot stop the stream to say, oh, wait, the music has stopped for about two seconds because we're looking for ads. We don't have, we cannot do that. And this is an example of big data where this is the big layer which can store, I don't know, terabytes of information if need be. We're up to hundreds of gigabytes now for this layer. And this is a a fast layer which stores, let's say, in the tens of gigabytes of data. And both of these layers are scalable independently. It means I can have four machines on the first layer and eight machines on the second one. 
In particular, for the fast layer, we use Redis and Memcached. And for the second layer, we use DynamoDB. Although there are, of course, other solutions that are, would have been compatible, like Cassandra or maybe even HBase. OK, another use case. This is something very simple that, in all likelihood, you've heard about. You have this big pile of work. In our uh, case, we have ads to encode to different, with different codecs and with different properties. That's one of our use cases. But we have a lot of these encoding jobs to do. And the rational, pr predictable, common sense thing to do is to split all this work between a lot of workers. And what we get is that we, we use simple queue service from Amazon to distribute this huge workload of millions of encoding ar around a cluster of uh, encoding machines, which varies in size. What this does for the business is that, maybe this guy comes in, says, um, well, it's taking too long to encode more ads. It takes two days to encode a new ads. It's unacceptable. This sort of architecture allows the technical side to say, well, give us more money and we'll fix it. And we turn a problem of, oh, we should research how we could encode faster into a problem of setting the size of this element here. Of course, you have more nodes, he pays more. But I sleep at night. So it's kind of a, he doesn't seem very happy, but it, he yeah, is. It's I know he is. <laughs> okay, now let's take this pattern and make it even more complicated. Let's say that the results are not just simple files, like MP3 files that I play and that I need to encode. No, maybe the result are the structure of our traffic over three months, which I need to run uh, drill down analytics on to find out how the traffic is gonna be and how the campaigns are going to deliver. Now, I do the same thing. I split it into workloads, which I process over a variable number of machines. I put it in a, in a data store, which in this particular case is Amazon S3. But then the business user comes again and says, yeah, yeah, you have all these great results, but I need to run queries on that results. I need a number. I need you to tell me how many ads I'm going to sell in New York on Android device between 10 and 12 a.m. to men who listen to jazz. And I need that answer in five seconds, regardless of the targeting criteria, which I will not tell you before. So what we do is that we take a sample of our traffic. We we process it through our simulation and prediction algorithms. We write the results here, and at the end, we copy all of this result data into a data warehouse, which in this particular case is Amazon Redshift. This data warehouse allows us to run queries on 100, 150 gigabytes of data, and not queries of, give me that record, queries of compute a sum of this very large function over all the data where these conditions apply. And we get a response in four or five seconds. Now, additionally to this use case, you can run into situations where you need to make sure that all of these workers finish their work and there, there's no work block or work item left uh, unprocessed because of some reason, an error, a node failure, whatever. What you do then is that when each block is finished, it is marked as finished in this data, in this state store, which is highly available. And at the end, after all the work is done, the master node just check, is there anything left unprocessed? If there isn't, great, we'll move on to the next step. If there is, uh, we should, requeue it and reprocess it. So these are some of the patterns we work on or we work with and these are some of the technologies we work with. Now it's not as my four speaker said it's a new market. Technologies apply all the time and the thing I like about my job is that we get to try out some of these technologies. I'll, I'll be honest, some of them don't work out. Some of them we throw away and we pick the other one. But 
it's a very interesting ride. And if you have questions about particular, I don't know, use cases or ways you should use big data, you know where to find us after the presentation. All right. Thank you. Thank you. There, there might be questions now. There might be questions. Questions? That was so clear. No questions? Please. Uh, Uh, so, uh, out of the 5 billion uh, hits per day, uh, what would be a peak per second, let's say? What would be a, sorry? A peak traffic per second, let's say, in a... Uh, in pff, let me do a, in the, I think around 10,000 requests per second in peak. The absolute peak, we have seen. But the thing we have to guard for is not, is that I give you this answer today, and if we meet again in two or three months, I might say 20,000, because these guys keep selling. Mm -hmm. I, I should ask you, uh, many times, uh, writing of a query task can be easier than cancel this query, because because uh, the replication and cluster of MapReduce translation of Hive mm -hmm. can be take a lot of time. And, the, and in this type of business, the cancellation of query can be... So the cancellation of a query... Uh, I ask for a uh, song. Right. I give up. Okay. And uh, I start the query to mm -hmm. the... Uh, database right and, and I want to cancel in this okay. moment and wait in uh, immediately to cancel okay uh, I think I understand the question so this kind of query give me an ad select an ad for this particular user doesn't go in Hadoop because if it would go in Hadoop it most definitely would wouldn't get an answer in 500 milliseconds uh, for this sort in 500 milliseconds no way um, for this sort of scenarios, we go to the fast layer, the one with the milliseconds for which we use uh, memcached and uh, DynamoDB for the milliseconds time. The stuff that we use Hadoop and Redshift for are the reporting workloads, which uh, go like, uh, show me how many queries I had with this parameter in the last two weeks. And that's, that has to go through gigabytes of data, and it takes a some seconds. If you cancel that, um, there is a protocol in Redshift at least that uh, signals the cancellation to the slave nodes as well. But until that uh, query is cancelled, some resource will be wasted, of course. Thank you very much. Hope that answers the question. Any more questions, maybe? Yes, so uh, when the Dino and MoDB, if I uh, don't confuse it to something else, when you make a query, you can have multiple results because it's a uh, non consistent, uh, not strongly consistent uh, okay. environment. And uh, what is the conflict resolving strategy you have with the data last right wins of what kind of. Uh, uh, we are fortunate enough in advertising that uh, this sort of uh, strategy with the last right is good enough. Mm -hmm is good enough for our use case. However, there are situations, and we have come across this situation, where you need strict consistency. And um, for instance, uh, some of the data stores, um, Dynamo in this case, offers strict consistency, offers strict consistency, but at the performance penalty. We don't particularly need it, but if you were to work in banking or in some transactional system, you have the option, both in Cassandra and in DynamoDB, to make the rights strictly consistent with some performance degradation. That's a question. Uh, More, please. Thank you. Um, my question is strongly related to multi-clusters. Are your applications running on clusters on different coasts in the US or things like that? Of, how dif of how different? Different coasts. 
Di okay. Different data Regional centers. Regional areas, you mean? Right. Yeah. Right. So, so geo uh, replicated, distributed, eventually, mm -hmm. and um, if you have this kind of, uh, we have considered it. For the moment, most of our, I mean, the, our production workloads are in Europe. We have considered uh, replication, and um, for this uh, for this scenario, what we would have done is create two different clusters for all the big data part, and just replicate the relational data, the the one in uh, in MySQL, the. Our replication model was more around the fact that uh, if this client has most of the traffic from the US, then we'll set up his cluster in the US. Because otherwise, if you um, serve, let's say, a workload from both, uh, from both coasts or from several data centers, you'll incur huge uh, charges for transfer. And that's that's a problem in the business case, not just technical. There is too much data to do that. The so much data to do that, to, to replicate in the streams. The um, uh, moral of the story is that if you go for the S3 strategy, um, then you will have to duplicate a lot of workloads. For instance, we have the primary data we have in S3. Uh, and say, let's say we keep that in the US, in S3. But then we'll have to replicate the reporting, the forecast, the encoding workloads on both sides. Either that or we have traffic for replication. We haven't come across that. I mean, um, we haven't split it on both coasts yet. So. But it's anyway, it's, it's one, it's a two data center, actually it's three regions in Europe, right? So it's already replicated, but we don't manage it. It's not, it's not geographically replicated. Yeah, that's that's well. the, that's the thing. What is your opinion about recommendation system over your big data? A recommendation system? Recommendation system, because you correlate a lot of information and it's very interesting for people to recommend some uh, advertising products? Um, the um, nature of the business rules um, didn't push us in the direction of Mahout and uh, let's say data mining strategies because the algorithms we run on our data, the filtering, the prediction, the reporting have pretty straightforward rules and we are not necessarily uh, at least at the moment, with the workloads we have, we're not necessarily looking for patterns. We know the patterns we need to apply, the business rules we need to apply, it's just that we need to apply them at a very large scale. So it's not, we haven't come across data mining, at least yet. Thank you very much. All right, ah, one last question. One more. <laughs> so I know uh, Google is one competitor and uh, what is your uh, strategy with the competitors and how is it that you made the first place or that what you said at least? Yeah, I'll, I I'll think that, that goes question. to you. <laughs> no, it's a good question. So when, when you're in the online business or online advertising business, the first question that you get is, all right guys, so Google will compete one day with you guys. So first, um, what we're trying to do is we try to focus on some niche market. We're trying to do it extremely well and we do it before them. Of course, they could probably do what we do even better because they have like unlimited financial means to do that. We're just like a couple of months ahead of them, okay? And that has enabled us also to create a market. So we have, like today, if you look at the market, a big share of the market is using our technology and that's how we can protect our market share. If one day Google wants to fully compete with us, well, either they'll need to buy us or they'll need to quit the market. That's our hope, all right? But I don't want to be arrogant and obnoxious. Google, they're fantastic. It's an amazing company. So we shouldn't underestimate them. But by taking this niche approach and trying to do things like a year before they can do it, we sort of protect our market shares. That's, that's the trick. And there is a chicken and egg problem. The more customers you have, the bigger the market you create, the bigger the barriers to entry you create. That's, that's a little bit the, the, the reasoning here.
But a lot of companies have, have tried to do that in the video business, for instance, and they have failed either because they were a bit too slow or because they were not niche enough. And Google has trashed them. That's the stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Some you. Uh, let's listen, Mr. Valentin Red Redut. Mr. Valentin Redut from uh, Computari System Architect, and uh, the speech will be about the directory structure, the heart for subscriber data management application. Mr. Valentin Raduzzi. Oh, oh welcome. Hi. Hear me? Right. Um, so, hello, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. And 